Hello traders, it's Tuesday, May the 2nd. This is John Kickleiter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for the opening of this trading week as well as this trading month. And more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the 24 to 48 hours ahead. Well, it was a remarkable uh, development in terms of... Uh, certainly some of the event risk on the docket and uh, some high profile extreme readings on the VIX, extreme low, not high. Uh, but we wouldn't really get a lot of progress one way or the other when looking at uh, some of the benchmarks for actual capital placement. The Spider ETF or the S&P 500 representative, uh, as you can see here, held very comfortably within the uh, range that it had developed over the previous trading week. So complacency was the name of the game. There was a little bit more risk uh, development on some of the risk-oriented assets. When we look at the carry trade index, there was actually a bump higher. Emerging markets actually had a noteworthy jump higher, although uh, barely tallying the advance, and the high-yield fixed income dropped lower. Now, this mix is well within reasonable bounds of movement. It's not like one is leading the other. They're still very much contained, but there is certainly reticence to call trend on either direction. And that reticence is well established when we look at the extremeness of the VIX volatility index, a favored measured uh, measure of risk trends. Now, as extreme as this measure is, and it is quite extreme, I go into detail uh, about uh, some of the statistics behind it in today's strategy video using charts like this. This is the lowest close for the VIX, the spot index VIX, uh, since back in February of 2007. So that is quite extreme. But it is generally the mark of quiet and a very profound uh, comfort with complacency that we have to be mindful of. It doesn't mean that there is inevitably and immediately going to be a turn in the entire markets, that you know the fuse is run out and something's going to explode. It doesn't necessarily mean that, and we should be very comfortable with the fact that, yes, the quiet can extend for a little longer, or if you want to see it that way, the bubble uh, can blow a little bit bigger. It can always go into deeper extremes. So it's not worth trying to jump the gun uh, because we can hold through a drawdown, especially if there's time premium associated to whatever market you're getting into, uh, and that could certainly cause pain, all right? making us incapable of actually uh, recognizing or uh, funding a trade when the turn actually occurs. All right, with that little PSA out of the way, it is somewhat surprising that the markets were so restrained over the past session. Why? Well, we did have some noteworthy event risk uh, associated to the S&P 500 and, uh, frankly, the dollar uh, to start off this new trading week. We had a couple of uh, remarkable uh, updates from uh, the U.S. government. One is that over the weekend, it seems that Congress had made significant progress on a spending bill that could uh, rise to as much as a trillion dollars and avert the uh, constant uh, push to deadlines and one-week extensions that we had suffered in previous years. Uh, we did see an extension from this past Friday midnight uh, up until this coming Friday's midnight, but if this $1 trillion uh, spending bill actually goes through, it's going to curb the threat of uh, the very painful and tedious uh, reaction from the markets to when uh, the U.S. government shuts down, which we've seen uh, in uh, previous years. Now that was a positive. Uh, traditionally, if we were looking at it in a very academic way, we could say, well, the dollar should rise on that. We would also say that the relief of risk from the Spider ETF or S&P 500 or any U.S.-based asset uh, should respond positively because it insinuates a risk, uh, a hurdle removed potentially. But in reality, we know that the markets aren't too concerned about this, even though it carries uh, serious weight and uh, a disastrous turn could be very disastrous uh, in terms of uh, the government shutting down. Uh, but complacency is so ingrained that the worst case scenario is uh, frequently clipped off, hence why volatility is so extremely low. 
Now that was one measure. Here's treasuries too. Uh, that was one development that we had for the uh, U.S. government uh, and political or fiscal uh, standoffs. The second was the suggestion that President Donald Trump uh, may actually push through uh, law that would aim to break up the big U.S. banks. Now, U.S. banks and financials did uh, uh, had a uh, knee-jerk reaction, certainly uh, very concerned with this uh, claim, but as you can see, it wasn't a escalation. It didn't hit the bigger, broader market measures, uh, hit the borders of uh, risk itself. So we keep close tabs on the political aspect. It certainly has uh, plenty more uh, run room on it for event risk, but it's something that we are not really uh, readily able to benchmark. We can't time it because most of these updates come at, at, at most two days in advance. So it doesn't serve well uh, for incorporating into overall strategy uh, for dictating a change in complacency. Now, for the dollar, it was quite remarkable this past session that we didn't actually see a more substantial move. Uh, the docket that we had was actually quite constructive. Besides uh, the updates of uh, the possible spending bill and the possibility of breaking up U.S. banks, large U.S. banks, uh, the data was pretty disappointing. Uh, we had weak construction spending, we had a, a contraction in the growth of manufacturing industry, and personal income and spending. Spending essentially zeroed out and income slowed. And the PCE deflator, the Fed's favored inflation indicator, dropped to uh, faster than expected below the 2% threshold. Now that should give uh, the market a little bit more pause. That come Wednesday with the FOMC rate decision, the probability of a more dovish leaning Fed should seem greater. That being the case, as it may be, the markets are not forecasting a rate hike at the May meeting. Right, the probability is very low. The interest is instead in June. And it has been the case that the Fed has been very reticent to make a call and certainly alter its communication uh, effort on the update of one piece of data. So and essentially the market's anticipation is that, yes, this is concerning, but at the same time they don't think it's going to alter the pace of the Fed's tightening regime. Hence, we have little movement on the S&P 500, little movement from the dollar. But keep an eye on this dollar. It is so narrow. We have such a tight range after what could have been construed as a significant technical break. Again, a head and shoulders neckline break as well as a trend line break. And yet, just beyond the border, it stalls. This concerns me and uh, speaks to greater pressure uh, than something like the S&P 500, which is consolidating just at record highs, or the VIX, which is at an extreme level of 10. For the dollar, it has much more range it can actually work with. It uh, had just moved beyond a technical boundary, and there is little hesitation, there is little uh, statistical uh, skew that would keep this from launching higher or lower, given the right motivation. So this is where I think uh, most of the pressure actually rests. It's not as extreme as the S&P 500, it's not as uh, leveraged as the VIX, but it certainly has much greater anxiety and, more importantly, has greater potential of moving in both directions, provided it is given the push. Now, I'm going to be watching the dollar very closely. Obviously, uh, there are a number of 
dollar-based crosses that I think have great potential. Euro USD is the most uh, equally set in terms of bullish bearish potential. Although be mindful, Wednesday does carry both an e, you know, the eurozone GDP figure as well as the FOMC. So that's a big combination of event risk that can complicate the picture. Uh, something like the pound dollar is less complicated, more oriented towards the U.S. and obviously FOMC on Wednesday, uh, but it is a little bit more uh, aggressive and and minimizing the importance of key data or key levels. You can see that we've crossed above this 2850 threshold, 2875, 20, uh, and uh, we're kind of meandering at this level. Dollar yen carries additional factors. It's not just the dollar, it's risk trends. Uh, I don't really uh, consider too many of the Japanese events, or at least scenarios for the events, uh, as being capable of generating serious traction for the yen, short of the Bank of Japan making a concerted effort to try to uh, change the value of its currency. All right, so most of this is risk trends oriented, and subsequently it is uh, a dollar risk combination, which as it stands, given the US dollar's uh, orientation towards high yield, uh, this actually has a leveraged response. Upside is difficult to maintain, short of a very robust upgrade in interest rate forecast for the US dollar and risk trends. Alternatively, risk aversion and a drop in interest rate expectations for the Fed come hand in hand. Subsequently, a drop can come faster and is a more capable or potential uh, scenario. Not probability, potential. Aussie USD has some potential, but it is going to be wrapped up in the RBA. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the Kiwi USD's technicals do stand out for 2850 as a noteworthy fib. It also happens to be a trend line support. Uh, the range is pretty well established, uh, but do be mindful of uh, the activity level. There is a New Zealand employment statistic, which include wage figures uh, in the upcoming session Wednesday morning. That can certainly generate a lot of volatility for the New Zealand dollar if it's a surprise, but it won't likely last and provide a lasting trend. That's a boon and a detriment, depending on how you look at it. And dollar CAD, the slow uh, push through that 136 level continues. Not a whole lot of conviction that I can take away from this uh, kind of sharing its uh, influence from the dollar and oil. All right, so the dollar base crosses have a lot of potential, but I also want to talk about the risk measures. There are plenty of risk measures out there, including, I mean, the Aussie USD is a great measure of risk, but the yen crosses are the most attuned, at least from the volatility perspective. Now, when I look at risk trends and I look at the skepticism and the persistence of something like the S&P 500, uh, this is not a finely tuned measure. It is a very skewed or asymmetrical measure, which is a value in and of itself. It tells me when sentiment is extreme enough that it can actually uh, gain serious traction uh, across market. But if I want something that is far more sensitive, looking across the various measures that have risk, in, uh, risk connection to the emerging markets, uh, high yield, even commodities, all right, we can see which of these measures, which of these metrics, has a more profound and uh, sensitive disposition. Here we go. And I think that it's going to be carry trade. Carry trade index is in this benchmarking, benchmarking it to May 1st, 2016, uh, the second uh, worst performing, although uh, commodity index, this is the Reuters commodity index, is certainly underperforming, but that's because uh, in a lack of sentiment derived uh, market ambition, uh, commodities revert back to a very heavy fundamental influence, uh, uh, growth expectations and such. Carry trade is exclusively a risk theme. All right? it, it, it chases yield at all cost. So Watching something like the carry trade harvest index from Deutsche Bank, which is an ETF, uh, this is one of the underperforming. This is far more sensitive to the back and forth of risk trends. Now, it doesn't mean that the rest of the market has to catch, but if there is a early signal that sentiment is going to uh, decline or rise, it is more likely to come from something like this, a greater day-to-day -day sensitivity. Now, 
That being said, these yen crosses are attractive for this reason. Dollar complicates uh, the dollar yen's relationship, but euro yen, for example, that is a good combination of technical resistance. Now, this is only uh, appealing if the turn in risk trends is going to happen immediately. And if, in other words, uh, the S&P 500's next move were to be a down move to break from this range to the lower floor uh, that we've re recently established, then that would align to a timing of risk aversion that could match the technicals that we have on the euro yen. That's a bit uh, presumptuous, a little too ideal, but always laying out scenarios just in case. Aussie yen has already slipped back above 84, but it still holds to the general level. A break of former support, new resistance kind of mentality, this can certainly provide. Kiwi yen, if there is a advance in risk trends, a recovery, while the S&P 500 would probably struggle with it, you might be able to get something more from a Kiwi yen or even a CAD yen, as it has yet to break above 82, but that is a channel top for it, and it has precedence for higher range. So the opportunities are there, uh, pound yen as well, uh, though it's already making a move. The opportunities are there and the preference is for something a little bit more sensitive, especially if you are looking for something that looks like it can actually make progress with a risk on view. I wouldn't want to go to emerging markets or US based equities or even global equities as uh, where they stand historically, they're already pretty rich. Carry trade, the orange line here, however, has certainly more room than it can advance. Its own historical uh, performance as well as reference to other asset classes and percentage returns. On a much longer scale, going back to the great financial crisis as our benchmark, the same. All right, greater potential there than trying to squeeze the final drops out of something like the S&P 500. There is rarely a time where that is advisable. So dollar and risk trends are certainly going to be in our forefront. Risk trends, it's di very difficult to gauge what is going to be the spark for that. It requires a catalyst that touches a theme that is an interim theme and subsequently escalates to something far greater. Sentiment and repositioning of risk capital. Nothing on this docket really speaks to me as that kind of potential short of Wednesday's FOMC rate decision. Friday's not farm payrolls doesn't. So I will be keeping a close eye on it, but always looking for the measured moves. If we're restrained on risk aversion, and if we are uh, limited by options for risk on, we have to be more creative and we have to be more uh, mindful of what we're going to uh, target as a trade opportunity. Now, other themes are actually active. Uh, this past session, uh, we did have a couple of uh, Brexit updates, especially over the weekend. Uh, we had uh, reports that uh, Juncker, uh, EU President Juncker and uh, UK Prime Minister Theresa May had uh, some pretty uh, concerning conversation about uh, the UK not being prepared for the Brexit and, and su subsequently their misleading uh, expectations, although it was denied uh, by Theresa May's uh, uh, group. Uh, and the EU Council over the weekend produced the guidelines for its negotiation approach to Brexit. All right. Noteworthy, we're making progress on this uh, for better or worse, but uh, does it give new life to the pound? Well, not really. Uh, you could say that it uh, curbed uh, some of the ambitions of the pound, attempting to get to more significant levels, but uh, it definitely can't say that it uh, has necessarily given clear directive. I'm keeping an eye on pound Aussie. We talked about this being a break last week, and as you can see, not a lot of conviction behind it. We always have to measure our technicals with the, the measure of, of conviction. And if you're going to do that purely on a chart basis, it probably means a consolidation after a bear trend of this magnitude requires more uh, follow through. But you're probably better off doing a combination of the technical and fundamental analysis. Now, in the upcoming session, the UK docket uh, will offer us some data, uh, though, as we've seen many times before, it's not data that is moving the pound, it is updates on Brexit uh, negotiations, and we don't really have anything explicitly scheduled for that. Now, another high-profile piece of event risk that we should keep on our radar 
by the time you watch this, it may already have already passed the wires, but the RBA rate decision. Uh, the RBA is not expected to do anything, really. Uh, looking at uh, rate forecasts through overnight swaps, uh, the probability of a rate hike in the coming 12 months is exceptionally low. You know, we're talking about a 20% probability in the next 12 months that the RBA can hike. The probability that they hike at this meeting, zero. Now, the Australian dollar is already doing pretty well for the session. Monday's session was actually advancing. And it wasn't just advancing against the dollar, it was advancing everywhere. AussieCAD, where this has a far more uh, explicit reflection of the Australian dollar, you can see we did mark some ground. Aussie Kiwi as well. Now, if the RBA does not follow through with some kind of uh, shift in expectations, not an actual policy change, but changing the RBA's uh, view or the market's assumption of their view uh, to something a little bit more dovish or hawkish. It's probably going to go uh, pass without uh, significant influence. In fact, it might even be the case that the Aussie dollar pulls back a little bit because there is perhaps some outlier exposure expecting a mild hawkish shift. But I wouldn't expect it to lead to a meaningful trend. It is very good for scheduled event risk. It is certainly going to be a high profile update, but don't uh, sit around expecting a big move here. Other Asia event risk includes the BOJ governor speaking after the BOJ minutes release, the PMIs from Japan, and a Chinese manufacturing PMI from the private source, uh, Caxon. We will get into Europe with uh, both Asia and Europe coming back online. Monday was uh, liqu uh, holiday liquidity, so perhaps uh, watch that VIX bump up a little bit just by virtue of more turnover. But we do have uh, the European session picking back up with the finance minister from Germany speaking about the G20 agenda. Uh, the chancellor of the, uh, of the German economy is actually going to speak about that the following day. And on corporate news, we do have Apple's first quarter earnings. Uh, this is one of the largest companies in the world. So, yes, it does matter. Now, aside from data, which is quite limited, and the anticipation, which is quite extreme, and the measures that we are looking at here, uh, there are a couple of uh, outlets that I do think uh, warrant a, a brief review. Uh, looking at the Chinese yuan, the Chinese currency, uh, it's been pretty extraordinary that it's consolidated into su such a tight range. Uh, I think that there is uh, certainly an effort by Chinese officials to prevent their currency from continuously depreciating, which is a concern for them. Uh, many believe that they just want their currency to devalue uh, so that their exports uh, can uh, be cheaper to foreign buyers. But they certainly want to curb the depreciation of the currency as much as they want to curb the appreciation of it. Now, I'm quite concerned that there is actually efforts being made to curb this move, which can oftentimes lead to problems. And one of the good measures of uh, highlighting this is the dollar HKD, which is the Hong Kong dollar. Uh, dollar Hong Kong dollar is essentially a different outlet for capital into and out of China. The Hong Kong economy is essentially a funnel for mainland funds. So when we see its exchange rate rise, it usually speaks to some pressure, funding pressure uh, behind uh, this, some market pressure that they, didn't, they don't have the funds to control just yet until it's some extreme. So I'm keeping a close eye on this. Another one that I'm keeping a close eye on that isn't uh, often referred to is uh, Bitcoin. It uh, continued to advance to new record high, about 1,400. Uh, I don't think that this is any significant shift in blockchain technology or uptake by markets, uh, but rather I think that this is probably evidence that uh, there is a strong demand for the cryptocurrency to avoid a capital control. Hard to say which one China has recently cracked down, uh, though they haven't cracked down on all of it. And the last thing I want to look at is commodities. Gold had a significant pullback this past session. Technically speaking, that brings us back below 1260, which was a, sub a substantial resistance up until uh, the second week of April, when we finally broke through. But that breakthrough put us right into contact with a 
trend line resistance that goes back to the record high that we had set and subsequently now we see that rejection pulling back. Now obviously where the dollar goes, where the absolute need for risk or safe haven goes and where inflation pressures go, uh, so too will gold follow. Uh, so look for your fundamentals there. This is not a supply and demand consideration. More supply and demand is oil. Uh, we are testing that support on channel and it is a significant technical level. We've seen it tested repeatedly. Keep a close eye on this. If it does break, I'd be a little bit skeptical about fall through, not a little, a lot, uh, unless there is something systemic in the increase in supplies, which typically tends to be uh, the main driver, or has been the main driver of the past year and a half, two years uh, for this commodity. All right, but technicals look quite appealing. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.